Hey everyone, today I'm joined by Damian Trites. He had a very troubled upbringing when he was growing up, getting into fights, hanging out with gangsters, in and out of jail. Damian has now changed his life and has a hell of a redemption story. Damian worked his way up to being a professional MMA fighter. He did that for quite some time and then eventually stepped down and became an actor. Damian is working on his own project as well that we talk about during this interview. Shout out to Chicky Chickatelli for introducing me to Damian. Both of these guys are stone cold gentlemen. Please subscribe to my channel if you want to get more interviews like this. And without further ado, let's get into Damian's story. Hey man, how's it going? Good. How are you, brother? Pretty good, man. Thank you for taking out some time, man, and coming on my show. My pleasure, man. I uh, appreciate it. I think, you know, a good way to get into this interview would be talking about your early life and, you know, trouble that came while, while you're growing up. Okay, well, I uh, I grew up in Springfield, Massachusetts, the city of a population of about uh, 250,000 people. Um, it's a very industrial city, um, very uh, a lot of poverty here. Um, a lot of people grew up here poor, and um, you know, being an inner city kid, I had to go to all the inner city schools, so. Just like any other inner city, um, you know, predominantly I was the minority. Um, you know, most of the kids I went to school with were black and Hispanic. Um, so, you know, the schools that I went to, uh, there was not a lot of teaching going on. There was a lot of, um, you know, the students actually controlling these classrooms because really? the, te the teachers were actually too scared to teach. Uh, wow. in, in the classroom. So um, I witnessed a lot of stuff early on growing up. Um, you know, I saw, I witnessed my principal get stabbed in 1993 Shit. and uh, he died in the hallway and um, guns and lockers at like 12, 13. And we're going back to like 1993 when I was, you know, 13, 14 years old. And my parents had had enough of Springfield. Um, they wanted more for us, me, my brother, and my sister. So we relocated to New York, to Long Island. Damn, man. I did not know Springfield was that, that wild out there, especially back in the eighties and nineties, you were growing up there. Yeah. So I grew up, you know, early nineties, you know, I mean, look in the eighties, I was really, really young. Yeah. I'm 43. So, you know, um, in 93, I was, I was 13. So mm -hmm. I would say the early, early 90s, Springfield was really, really, really bad. There was a lot of gangs here. There was a lot of gang activity going on. And um, what were you know, the main gangs? Latin Kings, uh, mostly Span mostly Spanish gangs. We didn't mm -hmm. have any of the Bloods and the Crips back then. It was mostly La Familia, Nietas, um, Los Litos, Solids, and uh, Latin Kings. And now with you growing up in that area, was there any potential gangs that, you know, with your race and ethnicity to join or were they, I mean, did it matter what race you were to be in any of these gangs? You know, I don't want to talk about like, uh, you know, the stuff that I was in, you know, a lot of the stuff that I was involved in, mm -hmm. but I had strong, strong ties to the Latin Kings. Um, mm -hmm. One of the um, female like leaders lived, mm -hmm. lived behind me in the house behind me. So I was one of the only white kids in the neighborhood that was that was invited to all the Latin King parties um, that wasn't a Latin King. So yeah. I'd be in a house. I'd be in a house party with like, you know, 40 to 50 high ranking members of the Latin Kings. And I was accepted like, you know, like family. So um, growing up, I grew up with a lot of a lot of Latin Kings. Yeah. So, I mean, definitely as a young kid, being around all that stuff has really got to you know, mess with your head. And I mean, that's all, you know, though, is that that's all you see around you. So I guess it was kind of normal. What'd you well, say? Look, you know, look, I'll be honest with you, you know, growing up, I was always trying to fit in because I got bullied. I was a small kid. I wasn't a big kid when I was younger. Mm -hmm. Um, very, very small. So obviously when you're small, when you're, you know, people are going to take shots at you and, you know, growing up, I was fighting all the time. You know, it was that, you know, you know, every weekend was a fight, you know, some sort of fight in the neighborhood or at school uh, and that sort of stuff. So I, I, I just grew accustomed to violence. Um, being around violence uh, as, a, as a young kid uh, kind of hardened me. You know, it made me, it made me kind of hate people and hate, um, you know, just hate 
kids, you know, kids are, kids are tough when you're, when you're young, you're trying to fit in. So, um, I was a little bit of a follower because I was small and I had no choice, but to kind of be a follower because it was like either, you know, fit in and follow these people that are bullying you or just continue to take abuse all the time. So it got to a point where, um, further on in my life, instead of getting bullied, now I became the bully. Well, not a bully. I was never really much of a bully, but I actually learned how to, um, I, I started to educate myself on how to fight and stuff like that. But that came later in life around when I was like 16, you know? Yeah, no, I would imagine that would harden you up because, you know, getting, getting fights and being treated like, you know, shit, especially kids, man, they, uh, they seem to be more ruthless with, you know, all the, all the bullshit. Cause then I don't, their brains ain't fully developed and shit. No, so and, just... and, and you know, and you know, when you're, when you're a kid, you're fearless, right? You're not scared of shit. You know what I mean? No. And, and you know, like you think that you're fucking invincible, mm. you know? And, and I thought that I was invincible. And, you know, if one of the older guys, the OGs in the neighborhood, you know, told me, go hit that dude, right? Go punch him in the face. I want you to prove yourself, right? You didn't ask questions. You just did what you were told. You know what I mean? And if, if, if you took an ass whooping, you took an ass whooping. I mean, those times were different back in the day. I mean, um, you know, there was more fighting back then. Um, there wasn't so much the gun violence and the, and the, ni- the knife stuff like that happens today. But don't yeah. get me wrong, that stuff did go on. There were a lot of murders. There were a lot of killings and stuff like that with the gangs. But um, I didn't wrap myself up too much in the gang life at an early age, you know? Yeah, no, I mean, it's just something that, you know, no no kid, you know, should ever have to go through. But, you know, it's it, that's what's going on. I mean, this shit obviously is, seems to be everywhere, and it's getting worse and worse. So, I mean, you know, you got to learn how to defend yourself and not put up with nobody's, you know, shit or else they're going to walk all over you and, Hell, that's what you did. You started learning to become a fighter, right? I mean, you, you eventually, I mean, yeah, you, I think you had a lot of street fights and stuff like that, right? Before you started. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, okay. So my parents, you know, decided Springfield, they had had enough with Springfield. They, you know, they saw that the city was going down the drain. They were just, you know, city, you know, this city used to be a nice city, you know, and it used to be called the city of homes because we had a lot of, um, you know, historic homes here, you know, but, um, unfortunately, you know, you know, people moved into the neighborhood and they, you know, they destroyed the neighborhoods and stuff like that. And it just became, uh, flooded with poverty and, you know, uh, people being, uh, victims of, uh, their own environment and stuff like that. And it just kind of, you know, started to get so bad. So my parents said, let's move to New York, you know, and they thought that it was a good idea. Um, I was devastated. I was 13. You know, I was leaving all my friends, my family, my whole family and my friends are from here. So at 13 years old, that's a tough time to move. You know, you're just you're in middle school and you have to go from being in middle school to high school, but at a whole new high school where you don't know anybody, you know, mm-hmm. yeah, so mess with you. Yeah. So my, trou- so my troubles, my troubles only started to snowball more. Um, yeah. you know, I moved to New York and now I had, now I did not fit in at all. And now I'm, now I'm trying to fit in even more because I'm an outcast. I'm from mass. I'm from Massachusetts. I talk different than these guys from New York. And it was just, it was just, you know, went from fighting once a week to when I was in Springfield to fighting almost every single day, you know? Jeez. Um, so, you know, I got bullied a lot when I moved to New York, but I started to grow. I started to get bigger and I started to get so angry to the point where I stopped taking the abuse, I, I said to myself, I'm going to put my foot down and enough is enough. And my father got sick of it. So my father used to say to me, look, if you come home crying, I'm going to give you something to cry about. Right. Damn. He said, you know, if somebody punches you in the face, I don't care if you win or you lose, you punch in time to punch in your time clock and go to work. Right. Mm-hmm. Because no son of mine is going to be, a crybaby. At the end of the day, you know, stop telling me what you're, what's going on in your life. You know, I, I appreciate it. I love you. But at the end of the day, you got to learn how to defend yourself and protect yourself. So that was the message I got from my father. So one day at the age of uh, 15 years old, I was being followed by some bullies, some kids that didn't like me for whatever reason, because I was different. Um, and one guy was uh, flicking the back of my ear while I was walking to the bus. 
and I just started to cry. I'll never forget it. I started to cry and I was just, I was at my boiling point. I had reached, you know, from here, it just went over my head and I just couldn't control myself anymore. And I just turned around and I hit him as hard as I could. And I knocked him out cold in front of all of his friends, you know, and yeah. I was screaming, I was screaming at the top of my lungs, but I, I was like psychotically angry. I was crying. I was completely emotional, but I was psychotically emotional. Like I was, I was, I blacked out. I don't remember mostly what happened. I just remember screaming. I remember them like looking at me different, you know? And from that day forward, I, I, um, I stumbled upon a boxing gym. I started boxing. Um, I was beating up grown men in the gym. I started to, you know, develop my boxing skills and stuff like that. And then, um, I got, And then a significant thing happened in my life. Um, It's funny. The guys that were bullying me out by the bus became my best friends. You know, they all became my close friends. And I started running with them. And they were like the tough kids in the neighborhood, like the bad kids, you know. And we had a crew. We had a crew, like 30, 40 of us, you know. (laughs) And we used to stand on the corner in in New York at a candy store in New York. And we used to stand there strong with the boom box, smoking blunts, drinking 40s every day, you know, looking, looking to fight every single day. So one day this guy from the neighborhood came up to me and he said, you know, you kids are going to, you know, you're going to end up in jail. You're going to end up dead. He said, I own a, I own a boxing gym. I'm part of a, um, a police activity league boxing gym in Glen Cove, New York. They have these PAL leagues. Um, they're not ran by police officers. That's just the name of it, you know. Mm-hmm. But um, they have people that volunteer their time that were involved in boxing and stuff. So I, I stumbled into a boxing gym and I started boxing. And then um, my best friend in 1996 committed suicide. So um, when he committed suicide, that's when my life started to really um, take a turn for the worst. Um, I didn't want to live anymore. Um, I was severely in a really bad place mentally because of the loss of my friend. So I started to do, you know, I started to do bad, bad stuff. I don't really want to get into why I ended up in, 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 I ended up upstate New York um, for, um, 36 months, but I did 36 months. And, um, from the age of like, I want to say like 16 to like 19, somewhere around there. And when I came home, my parents had decided to move back to Massachusetts, but they hadn't moved yet. But when I came out, I was a completely different person. I was 170 pounds. I was big. I was strong. I was athletic. I was a monster because when I was in there, for that time, I did a lot more fighting. So at this point, I had had already probably, I'd say, 40, 50 street fights. You know? And, and uh, you know, a lot of those weren't wins. A lot of those were losses. Mm-hmm. But, you know, when you lose, you learn from your losses, and it only makes you better, you know? It makes you mentally stronger. It makes you just tougher in general, you know? True. So uh, when I came back to Massachusetts, I was sitting on my parents' front step and i said i need to make a decision either i'm gonna go into the military or i'm gonna or i'm gonna go back and get my my diploma i need to make a decision i can't just stay under my parents roof anymore i i i had had enough i was in and out of my parents house they had thrown me out multiple times i slept on couches i was homeless i went through a lot you know so i was just over living with my parents i couldn't do it anymore so I decided instead of going to the military, I went to job court. You know what that is? Yeah, and where they help you find jobs and stuff, right? They help you find a job, but they also give you a high school diploma, but you live there. Oh, okay. I didn't know that part. So they dorm you. They dorm you. So I thought job court was going to be, like, great. And don't get me wrong. It was really, really good. But it was it was kind of sort of like jail, but you weren't locked up, you know? Yeah. Meaning the type of people that were in the program. We're mm-hmm. all street people, you know what I mean? From all, all over uh, New England. So from uh, Massachusetts, Maine, Connecticut. Um, we had a couple people from, <coughs> excuse me, from New York. Excuse me one second. Are you good? But um, all that did was educate me on how to be a better street, a street person, you know, how to, I, you know, I started networking with people and stuff like that. Um, I joined up with a group in, in job core 
Uh, I don't want to get over the specific group that I joined up with, but in Job Corps, we had shot callers, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. You know, people that ran the facility, like the kids basically ran the facility, and then you had the staff members that would come to these certain shot callers because they heard maybe there was going to be a beef. There was a lot of fighting going on within the groups, you know, the different gangs and stuff like that. And uh, I was one of the shot callers in, in, in the group that I was a part of. Mm-hmm. And the staff would come to me and sit me in the office and try to have me make peace between the groups and stuff like that. And I was, I was always about peace. I never wanted there to be violence because violence was always the last um, move on the chessboard, so to speak, for me. Yeah. So um, when I came out of Job Corps, I had a high school diploma. I had a street education. And I had a lot, a lot of fights in Job Corps, you know. So, um, I immediately linked up with my friend that I was in Job Corps with, John Doomsday Howard, who fought mm-hmm. in the UFC. Okay, at the time he had no fights, I had no fights. So what ended up happening was I met a girl. Oh, oh. <laughs> I met a girl in Job Corps that I ended up having my son with. Okay. Yeah. And um, she was from Boston. So I made my way, I made my way to Boston and started training with John Howard. And basically, um, it started to snowball from there. I had my first professional fight in 2004. And I've had 17 professional fights since then. Um, You know, I lived in Southeast, South Boston, another another tough town, mostly Irish. and, you know, that that's pretty much my story as far as, like, my childhood leading up to my fighting career. Obviously, so much shit happened in my fighting career. I had so many fights. I was a bouncer for most of the time. I could tell you crazy stories about the bars and, you know, that, that type of stuff. And, um, you know, organized criminals that I was around and, you know, stuff like that. But um, that life is, like, past me now. Mm-hmm. I'm in I'm in a different space in my life right now. So like I, I don't even want to talk about the past because it's completely like irrelevant. I gave you a little bit of backstory on myself. Um and any other questions that you have, man, feel free to ask, man. I'm an open book, you know? Yeah, I mean you, since you know you you're talking about the future now, we could talk about the movie that you're working on and you know, other projects that you've been a part of. What was your first one that you were a part of and the ones that you're working on now? Yeah, so I was given an opportunity first, um, a pilot for a TV show called The Flanagans. Mm -hmm. A guy by the name of Jeff Canarsi um, wrote The Flanagans. He does uh, a podcast. I don't even want to give him any clout. I don't want to even mention his podcast name because uh, I'm not even going to look. I'm I'm my life's in a different direction now, so Mm -hmm. I'm not even going to badmouth the guy. but he gave me my first opportunity. So there was a positive that came out of a negative, right? Because the show never got completed. There was some legalities that happened, um, some things that happened behind the scenes. So legally they couldn't move forward with the project. Um, but it was an experience, right? I, I, it was my first time on a movie, on a TV show or any kind of movie set. So I learned a lot about film and, um, I played a cool character. I played a hitman, um, an Irish hitman. Um, mm-hmm. There was a there was a bunch of cool scenes that we shot. Hopefully someday we'll get a chance to see them. I don't know if that'll ever happen. Like I said, legally there's a lot of um, legalities. The reason well, at why least you can't... still got to get that experience. Exactly, you know I mean? exactly. It's not a total so that, loss. I mean, you got to start somewhere. Yeah, exactly. So with that experience, uh, that was one of the main um, experiences that I had to kind of have me start thinking, right? Yeah. So that I wanted to start doing more acting. I wanted to start being involved in more film and stuff like that. And then the second opportunity that I was a part of was a project by called Witsec Mafia. Yeah. Witsec Mafia is a project by John Gotti Jr. Um, he, he, he wrote it. It's based on all, it's all based in, by actual events, like things that happen. So I play a guy by the name of Teddy Deegan who was murdered, but it's basically exposing the witness protection program. Joe the Animal Barbosa is the first episode that I was a part of. Like I said, I played played Teddy Deegan. 
But um, Joe the Animal Barbosa was the first ever wit, wit, witness in WITSEC to get murdered. But it was Maybe. a huge... Uh, they tried to cover it up, the FBI. So yeah. basically what this episode is about is exposing the government um, and the Joe the, the Animal Barbosa case. With him, you know, yeah, he, he had a really fucking bad case because he... He put four men away for something they didn't do, right? Yep, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So that that, that they, the episode's all about that. It's all mostly all reenactments of what happened. Yeah. Um, they reenacted my murder. Obviously, they set me up to be murdered first. So there's some scenes leading up to the murder where we're in we're in a, uh, a restaurant slash nightclub, and mm-hmm. these guys are talking about um. They're talking about a, a, a score, a potential score, and a lockbox and a safety deposit box in a bank that we're going to break into. And basically, I think that it's a big score, but they're actually setting me up to just go into this place to, to where they could shoot me in the back of the head and kill me. So that's that's the part that I play. Um, so fast forward, you know, after Witsec Mafia, COVID hit. Okay? And there was a lot of downtime. People were at home, you know, going crazy. There wasn't a whole lot to do. Um, so I used that opportunity with my partner, Brian Hoyle, who did 16 years in prison. That's how I met John Gotti Jr. Him and John Gotti Jr. were in Raybrook together in upstate New York in federal prison. So that's how I got the opportunity through WITSEC. So I said to Brian, I said, I'm going to start writing a story about Springfield, Massachusetts and the Irish mob in Springfield. I want to inspire, I want it to be inspired by true events, but not actual events, right? So I wanted to have like Easter eggs in the story that things that might have really happened are close to things that happened, yeah. but not based on a true story, if you understand what I'm saying, right? Yeah, no, I'll follow. When you make when you make us when you make a story, you gotta kind of Hollywood it up, you know, or you gotta make it yeah. a little bit more interesting you know, for TV, you know? So, um, I wrote several, several drafts of the story. It got revised a bunch of times. We finally had a, a, a a solid, um, product, a pilot for a TV show. And, um, to make a long story short, um, we had a few people waste our time, people that wanted to invest in this project that bailed on us you know we had some help along the way to make some videos to do some do some things to put some money towards the project to get you know a sizzle reel made and some other things put together um and basically hungry hill was dead in the water for like three four months maybe even more yeah and uh it was frustrating you know for a while there but uh we never stopped believing that it would happen and uh, I had a friend of mine, Kirk Ryan McFarlane from New Jersey, who's an actor, mm-hmm. reach out to me and tell me that he wanted to help me get signed to a talent management group, okay, called the American Talent Management Group. A guy by the name of Spencer Fomar, who's a producer, owns it. Mm-hmm. So basically, I signed a contract, an acting contract, because they're going to help me get uh, acting roles, right? Yeah. So that was the first step of where we're at now at hungry hill so i get a call from the guy um one of the owners of uh, american talent group a guy by the name of walt walt calls me and tells me you know yeah we got all your acting stuff we put you up on the website congratulations you know thank you for being a part of the american talent group i said i know i said no it's my pleasure i said thank you i appreciate the opportunity i'm excited i look forward to working on you know future roles and working with you guys and stuff like that. And I started to tell him about hungry Hill. He sounded very interested. So he told me, look, if you want, you can send your, your script, your pilot to the guy who handles the production side of things. He's the actual owner of the company, Spencer Fomar. He's made six movies. He said, I'm going to be honest with you though. Spencer gets lots of scripts that come across his desk all the time. Right. Hmm. Yeah, he might not get back to you. So I said, what do I got to lose? I'll take a shot. You know, true. Two months passed after I sent Spencer the, um, the pilot and Spencer called me and he goes, Damien, how are you? This is Spencer Fomar. 
I said, oh, my God, what's up, Spencer? I said, uh, I didn't think I'd ever, I'd ever get this phone call. We both started laughing. And he goes, well, you get in this phone call. And I want to tell you that I love the idea of Hungry Hill. The only thing is I want to change this from a pilot to a TV show to a feature film. It's much easier to get a feature film bought than it is a TV show because you have to have six to ten episodes already written. There's a lot more work that needs to go into this if we make this a show rather than make it a movie. Damn. So for the past six months to a year, we've been in pre-production working on completing the script and ironing out all the rest of the details so we can film in the fall. Damn, so it's all coming to fruition, man. It's all coming to fruition, man. We've done one fundraiser. We were able to raise some money for some loose money to complete the script, to put a pitch deck together. The pitch deck is coming together nicely. We're on the second draft of the um, the script now, the, 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 the movie script now. We're working with a writer by the name of Dax Campbell out of California. He's we're, me and Brian, my partner, are um, ironing out the script, giving him our ideas, and he's putting it all into um, the new script. So mm-hmm. it looks great. The story's actually better than it was when it was a pilot. <laughs> so I couldn't be more excited with the way that the story is. I really believe wholeheartedly that this story is going to change all of our lives. Any of the people that's involved in this, um, there's no movie out there like it. MMA and organized crime mixed in one. It's two very, very, very popular subjects and no, um i think that we have a home run here so i'm very very excited and i'm just working hard every day to try to you know try. keep the keep the ball moving forward you know yeah and you i'm gonna tell you you brought up a few good things you know like something that you know anybody that's working on any project or any thing in life you know when when she gets hard and you know it's not looking looking good you know like you said you're you're struggling for three or four months with it, you know, and you can't, you stayed with it. So that's, that's great, man. I mean, that just goes to show that shit can happen. If long as you stay at it and you stay consistent and don't just say, ah, forget it. You know, I'm, I'm done with it. You know, ain't nothing coming out of it. You know, listen, man, I, I'm going to be honest with you, man. Like I've had um, a spiritual awakening, so to speak mm-hmm. in the last six months of my life, I've been uh, placing a higher, Um, I've been placing a lot of faith into my, you know, my higher power and stuff like that. I've been doing a lot of praying and I'm telling you, prayer is powerful. And um, I'm actually happy with the man I am today, you know, opposed to who I was in the past. And I'm actually headed more towards that direction, towards the light instead of the darkness. You know, you know, I, I, you know, I don't drink anymore. I'm sober. Um, I, uh, you know, I'm just, my life is just headed in such a different direction today. And, and I, and I'm grateful because God is, um, you know, putting all the right people in my life and headed and, and, and guiding me towards the right direction rather than going back to all the other stuff that led me really nowhere. You know, at the end of the day, the streets are a dead end now, you know, they always were a dead end, you know, people that glorify that life, they obviously were never around that life because that oh. life is a, it's a treacherous life. It's not a good life. And uh, anyone who tells you different, never been around it, you know. Yeah. Um, and with that being said, um, I'm just extremely grateful. Um, and, you know, I'm excited with the path that Hungry Hill is finally um, moving in, you know. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, I and, do. And, and with that being said, it goes back to what you just said. Um Look, a lot of people, when they start to walk through the fire and they feel that heat, right? Rather than yeah. getting burnt, rather than getting burned, they, they, they say, you know what? I don't want to feel that heat. I don't want to get burned, right? right. They don't want to go into that forge and get burned, man. But at the end of the day, man, in order to be great in life, you have to be forged in the fire, man. You have to, you have to walk through fire. And you have to be willing to just grind and keep grinding and keep grinding and keep taking those hammer blows in the forge, right? Because yeah. that's the only way that you become great, man. Um, as a man, I feel it's very important to make yourself uncomfortable. Yeah. You know, if you're not uncomfortable in life, um, you know, and you're too comfortable in life, it's not a good thing. Um, it ain't. No, I, I agree with everything you're saying, man. I'm smiling as you're saying it because, you know, you're, you're saying exactly what I'm thinking and what other people need to hear because with, you know, going through any kind of project, like I said, you got to be able to take the ups and the downs. No one else is going to do anything for you. And if you want something done, you got to do it yourself because this is your project or whatever right. it is in life. And if you want to 
make it go somewhere. Yeah, you got to work on it every day. It's not just gonna happen like that. You know, <laughs> and it, listen, it don't happen listen, like that. Listen, man, if you have a dream, you have to chase your dreams, bro, and you have to not give up, man. You know yeah. what? The people that fuck that people that give up are never gonna be successful in life because they don't have the they don't have the hunger, they don't have the drive, they don't have the you know, when you people are faced with adversity, they normally quit, yep. you know, and it goes back to the whole martial arts for me, to be honest with you. I feel that the martial arts really made me, um, you know, be able to face adversity and um, keep moving forward and keep pushing forward. Because, look, I'll give you a perfect example in jujitsu, right? Yeah. When you get put in a, when you get put in a bad position on the mats, right, you mm -hmm. can quit and you could just tap, right? Yeah. Or you can continue to just fight. I tell a lot of my students, because I teach jujitsu now, I tell a lot of my students, I say to my students, in life, right, when you're faced with challenges, you don't run away from your problems, right? You 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 face your problems head on, and it's important. That goes with life. Yeah. It transitions to martial arts, too, the same thing, because as a martial artist, like, you're going to be faced with fire, especially when you're a fighter, Oh yeah. You know, you All step in that you step in that ring, you're risking your life at the end of the day. You know, like you got another man across from you that wants to take your head off and potentially you could die. You know, it's mm -hmm. not a game, you know, at the end of the day. Um there's no such thing as play fighting when you jump into that cage or that ring, you know? It's no. a serious serious business, man. And I I trans I translate my MMA career to my to, to the dream that I'm chasing now yeah. because um, instead of walking away from the heat, I walk towards it. You know, I just continue to keep going forward, man. And that's how you win in life, man. I, I wholeheartedly believe that. So anybody out there that's listening, if you have a dream and you have a goal and you have a vision that you can see in your head, you can do it, but you have to work at it. You can't just think about it and think, Oh, I'm going to manifest this. You know, everybody talks about manifesting now. Yeah, manifesting works, but you have to put in the work. Yeah. You can't just you can't just think about something and it's going to happen. No, you have to actually do the work. Yeah. So I, encourage, I encourage anybody out there that has a dream to set a goal and set small goals and just keep tackling those goals day in and day out. And eventually you're going to get there. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree with you because every week, you know, I'll be setting my goals. You know, OK, what's this week's goals to work towards? the bigger goal that you, you know i'm working towards so everything you're saying man i'm doing so that's why i'm like like i said i'm smiling while you're saying it because that's that's real shit you can apply that, yeah because that. You're, you're doing it too you're doing it too buddy <laughs> with your podcast you know yeah. and what people don't understand is i love i love the name of your podcast because it's so fucking true today yeah. i had to go and buy lights because <laughs> i was doing some self-tape tape stuff some self-tape work for acting auditions and stuff yeah. like that I had to come out of my own pocket and invest in myself yeah. because at the end of the day, man, nobody's going to invest in you. And if you're going to just be lazy and you're going to sit around, look, you're going to get opportunities, but you got to put in the work first. Yeah. And remember like with, with, you know, like for example, like all the stuff that you have in the background right now, you had to come up with that and spend your hard earned money. And that's investing in yourself. And I think that's the most important thing in life is to invest in yourself Make yourself a number one priority. Chase your dreams and just never give up, man. Yeah, no, absolutely true. Because everything that you do, you know, with the projects wise, clothing, business or anything, podcast, you know, you got to invest in yourself, you know, and especially invest in your time. You want to spend your time wisely and be around people that are, you know, on a good mindset and not going to fucking drain you, you know what I mean? And take all your energy with all their negative comments and all that. I mean, you got to be able to kind of distance yourself from that because if not you're gonna you're gonna come down to their level just hearing all their bullshit all the time even if you're not in it i mean you're just you're around it but toxic you know. toxic energy man you know yeah. toxic energy bro i don't i don't answer my phone if nobody's bringing nothing to the table and i don't mean money financial stuff i mean intelligent conversations what are we talking about are we talking about making money are we talking about positive stuff are we talking about going for a run in the park are we talking about making ourselves uncomfortable? Yes, I like those conversations. I entertain those conversations. But if you're calling me with drama, headaches, and all this stuff, and look, I used to be that guy, yeah. right? I had to change my mindset. 
Yeah. No, you came there's along. A, there's way. a really good listen out there for men. I want everybody to listen to it. It's uh Jocko. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know who Jocko is, but he was a Navy SEAL. Okay. okay? Jocko has a podcast and he has a, a book that he wrote called mm -hmm. The Discipline Equals Freedom Manual, the field manual. You mm -hmm. can look it up on YouTube. It's an audio book. Okay. It's all about discipline. No. Okay, as a man, being disciplined, how important it is to be disciplined as a man. That podcast and that audio book has taught me so much about life. And it's it's a great listen. So all the men out there, go listen to the Discipline um, Equals Freedom Field Guide. You can listen to it on YouTube for free. It's by Jocko. And uh, it's great. It's great. Yeah, I recommend no. it. Highly <laughs> recommend it, you know. Yeah, and that, that, that kind of stuff is what's important. You know, those kind of, you know, people that make content like that, that's actually going to benefit people in the long David run. David Goggins, he's another one, you know. Mm -hmm. David Goggins is another one. Yeah, well, uh, I, I think we're at that 35-minute mark. Do you uh, have, have anything you want to promote? I know you got your Hungry Hill coming, and I don't know what else you got going on. Hi, guys, I just want to say one thing before I close, man. Uh, it's amazing what prayer can do. And I don't care what you believe in, what your higher power is, whether it's your Muslim, Christian, Catholic, anything. I could go on and on and on about the religions, right? Yep. But what I do every day is I get on my knees in the morning and I, and I thank God that I'm grateful that I woke up, right? Because every day is a gift. Oh, yeah. Okay? I, I say a prayer. I get on my knees. I hop out of bed. I go to my knees and I, and I thank God. I say thank you for this day. And before I go to sleep, I say thank you for making me, making, you know, get me through this day. And I'm grateful for this day. And I'm telling you, the power of prayer is very, very powerful. Yeah, no, I'm you know, very, very powerful. So I recommend everybody that listens to this pray, get on your knees, be grateful, and never stop chasing your dreams. I want to um, give a shout out to uh, Chicky Chickatelli, oh, my yeah. friend, my best friend, yeah. one of my best friends, Chicky, uh, my partner, Brian Hoyle. Uh, Ian Morales, Spencer Fomar, Dax Campbell, Jenny Parada. Um, anyone that I'm missing, I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank. Stax has helped me. I want to give a shout out to Stax. Yeah. Um, all the people that have given me opportunities, John Gotti, uh, the, 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 the Tree Star clothing brand, my man, he gave me, he gave me this hoodie. I'm just blessed, man. I got good people around me, and um, I appreciate your time, man. It means a lot to me. Yeah, you have absolutely came a long way from your your past, and you you really changed it around, man. So that's why I thought, hey, I'm gonna bring this guy on my show. He's got a hell of a story, and you know, a redemption story. He's got a lot Yo, of good I'm, stuff I'm a going work, on. I'm a work in progress, brother. I really am. I'm a work in progress every day. I'm just trying to be better, mm -hmm. and I I encourage people to do the same. Thank you yeah. so much for having me. It means the world to me, man. Absolutely, man. Thank you. Have a great day. Okay. You too, man. Bye -bye. Well, what would you think about Damien's story? He's got a really interesting background, and now he's on to bigger and better things. Damien's living proof that you can have a troubled past and still make something with your future. Please comment any key takeaways that you got from this interview. Please share it with someone that you think will enjoy it. Also, please be sure to follow Damien on Instagram. I'll put his link in the video description so you can keep up with all the things that he's got going on. If you want to support me and my brand, I got t-shirts, hoodies, beanies, and sweats all on my website. I'll be sure to put my clothing brand link in the video description. Please subscribe to my channel if you want to get more interviews like this. At the end of this video, there'll be a mafia playlist that pops up that I think you'll enjoy. Thank you again so much for watching.